Good stuff. So let's do a quick bit of a uh, recap um, in terms of, you know, what we covered last week, which was regards to learning outcome two and learning outcome three. So essentially here we looked at, you know, the third learning outcome, which was basically discussing in a bit more detail about more, more or less, like I, I would say an overview about, you know, infection. So here, I think the idea was primarily to learn and understand what is infection, what is infection control, how infection spreads, what are the various type of microorganisms which cause infection, and then what could be the coordinated response which could be managed by healthcare practitioners. So it was a standalone uh, kind of a learning outcome that we have looked at in this particular unit, but it's a good addition to the unit because it helps you understand, you know, one of the key aspects of uh, how, infection, how infections actually spread when you're working within a health and social care setting. It's very, uh, you know, common. It is something quite easy that you can catch on an infection if proper care in terms of personal protective equipment and, you know, proper care in terms of following guidelines which are given is not done in terms of use of sanitizers, protective, uh, you know, clothing, as I would put it this way, the PPE, and also looking at, you know, ensuring that every, uh, in, in terms of, you know, the place of work and, you know, the patient's place of, uh, you know, uh, bedding and other bits, you know, are disinfected before they are put to use or, you know, put to use for another patient. Now, in the fourth learning outcome, we are going to be looking at understanding what are working relationships in health and social care. And when we talk about working relationships, we are basically looking into, you know, understanding multidisciplinary team working. So when we talk about MDTs, this is a term which will, you know, become synonymous with, um, you know, um, I would say, um, you know, let's say uh, when different partners, suppliers, contractors, staff, employees, they work together to be able to deliver integrated care to the patient. This is where we will see working relationships being formed. And when we, in general, look at organizations, when you typically look at uh, working within a company or a workplace, you generally have what are called working relationships, which you form with your colleagues, your peers, your friends, or, you know, your subordinates, essentially. And these working relationships, you know, um, essentially allow you to then work more effectively, uh, you know, with, in terms of, with obviously your colleagues and uh, peers, but also help you effectively deliver your job role and responsibilities on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we are going to be looking at covering in this particular learning outcome is understanding what is working relationship, what is the role of uh, individuals in terms of different types of individuals and see what kind of working relationships are formed within the health and social care setting. We will discuss and take this into a slight bit of further um, a detail to talk about relationships developing into partnerships. And partnerships typically are, uh, are also developed, with, you know, close partnerships are developed within the sector because you have dependency on uh, you know, uh, other organizations, people's colleague to be able to deliver the treatment which is being given to the patient. So, for example, when you look at a hospital, there is a partnership which the hot hospital has uh, because it's a big setup. There are lots of patients they are treating. There's, you know, maybe if not hundreds, thousands of staff which are working. They're teaching, uh, you know, they're essentially treating thousands of patients a year. There has to be a partnership or a working relationship which the hospital has which is very close in, uh, in, in their day-to-day -day working uh, with partners, suppliers, contractors, uh, you know, people who basically come in externally and provide some of these services so that the hospital is able to deliver treatment to patients and the staff and employees working within that hospital, medics, practitioners in general as a term if I use, are able to deliver these services to the patient. We'll also be looking at evaluating the role of what teams essentially mean and how teamwork essentially helps in obviously, you know, delivering this integrated care plan to the patient. So if you see the learning outcome nicely talks about relationships, relationships developing into partnerships and partnerships for it to prosper over a period of time to for them to work over a period of time need to look at 
and having team development. That means there are teams which are formed and these teams or people within these teams actually work in a close working association, which will be called relationships, working professional relationships. And then they work as independent teams, which basically provide these services to the to the patient or, you know, to any sort of a setup, which is there within the health and social care, uh, you know, setting that we talk about. And then towards the end, we will look at analyzing because this is uh, going to stretch the task 4.1 into understanding what is the role of leadership in, uh, you know, creating, lead, uh, say, for example, relationships or uh, overcoming challenges which are faced by teams, people working in, uh, in this particular setup. And when you have... Uh, lots of organizations working together in partnerships. Now, in order to cover this learning outcome, we'll be looking at doing a bit of discussion, uh, you know, around some of the key, uh, you know, phrases or terms which have been used. And what I would do in this case is switch over to the presentation. And in the presentation, we'll look at the indicative content. So there's a fair bit of indicative content to be covered. And it is basically relating to the five bullet points that we have or five assessment criteria that we have essentially in this learning outcome. Now, we also want to understand, uh, you know, before we get into the specific individual criteria, we also want to clearly understand, uh, you know, the aspect of uh, what do you mean by relationships when we talk in the context of specifically health and social care. Now, when we look at the meaning of the word relationship just the literal meaning of the word you know relationships what do you mean uh, you know when we use the word relationship anybody what do you mean by the word relationship so when we talk about the literal meaning of the word relationship what we are essentially meaning by the word relationship here is that how do two or more people come together, remain connected, or, you know, basically interact with each other when they are working in a similar setup or in a, under the same roof or under the same setup. So typically what will happen is if I see somebody, if I'm based in Manchester and I'm traveling to Derby, for example, I might go in and meet somebody on that day, but this would not establish a, a relationship with that person. I'm going in to visit that person. Maybe I'm doing an inspection. Maybe I'm going and delivering a guest lecture. But essentially, my visit is, you know, for that day, for a couple of hours that I will be meeting that person. And I would get to know that person a bit. But I, because I don't work with that person on a daily basis or I don't need to, I don't depend on that person on a daily basis to com complete some of my activities or tasks. Now, in that case, I would say, you know, I don't have a relationship with that person or a working relationship with that person because I'm not dependent on that person to either complete my task or my inputs and outputs, which I end up producing in terms of activities are not directly associated or indirectly associated with the individual who I've gone in and seen at Derby. Similarly, when I look at, uh, you know, uh, if I look at this from a point of view of working within Manchester, within the college, and I look at a couple of people, 13, 14 people, which are currently working in the admin team, and I kind of deal with them on a daily basis. So when I go in, you know, they say, good morning, sir, or they meet up with me. And there are small meetings that I get into. I get, uh, you know, obviously um, called to look into some of the work they are doing and give them a bit of guidance. Now, in this case, because I'm meeting them daily, I'm working with them daily. I, I, I am uh, delegating tasks on a daily basis. I would say that I have a relationship with the team which works in the head office or in the main center uh, in Manchester. Now, this is where I would say because some of my work needs to be you know, done in close tandem and close coordination with some of the staff which work in administration, course coordination, admissions, and that is where I need to have a working relationship. That means I need to understand what makes them tick, what makes them, uh, you know, excel in work, what are the kind of responsibilities they can actually take, and, you know, what are their capabilities and skill set, which allows me to delegate responsibilities accordingly. 
Now, if you imagine and extrapolate that example into health and social care setting, you look at people who work within the health and social care setting as practitioners could be nurses, doctors, medics, pharmacists, occupational therapists, you have administration people, you have, uh, you know, public, uh, I would say healthcare professionals, you have healthcare assistants, you have people who generally would be looking into, say, working in the kitchen, laundry, you know, some of the other departments or technical technicians, which are basically dealing with equipment. At some stage, if you are a part of a particular department, say an orthopedic department or a gynae department, or for example, an oncology department, which is basically dealing with patients from cancer or dealing with patients who have, uh, you know, bone related problems or dealing in patients with primarily, you know, the ICU and, you know, the people who are undergoing clinical procedures, there is a team which will be there. And that team essentially, which is there would be working with each other on a daily basis on a very close they will have a very close working relationship because when uh, a team is put together to take care of certain things like for example if uh, there's a heart operation being uh, done there will be a team which always is coming together which could be a consultant a surgeon anesthetist you have a couple of clinical nurses you will be having healthcare professionals uh, obviously um, in this case there'll be some medical staff which is involved in the ICU uh, ward and then the journal ward and they would all be sitting together and obviously looking at running this uh, because there are a number of operations which are done over a month in uh, you know on, on a daily basis maybe on a weekly basis quarterly basis and yearly basis so there could be a couple of teams which are working together so there could not be one surgeon but a couple of surgeons one or two consultants and then they are all working closely in tandem to deliver certain aspects of care which is required if a patient is coming in and the operation needs to be done which is they have blocked arteries angioplasty has to be done this team is competent enough and they depend on each other to be able to you know get things done to get the get the patients uh you know uh, operated and then after that care is provided and then at some stage they get discharged so when we look at this as a option of uh working on a daily basis which requires close coordination, understanding, clear communication, and dependency on each other, then you would say a working relationship is formed. And this working relationship within the health and social care setting can be of different types. You could, uh, if the operation is to be conducted, firstly, the pre-medical staff would be dealing and dis doing discussions. If you put your thinking hat on, you would see that the pre-discussion, pre-operational you know, uh, operational staff would actually be discussing with family, friends, to give them guidance on what the operation would be about, what could be the outcome of operation, where things could go wrong, what is the support required after the operation has been done, how fast will be the recovery, what are the things which need to be changed in terms of diet, nutrition, all those things will be discussed. And that part of the team normally looks at doing consultations with patients, preparing them mentally, physically, their family members to be able to get to a stage wherein the operation date can then be fixed. And then the medics and the clinical team takes over because then everything has been signed, agreed, and you know the patient would receive the treatment. Similarly, you have colleagues, managers. So when I say managers, there would be people in management within the hospital. So there are people who have worked for a number of years, like for example, a surgeon who has worked in the hospital for 20 years, his main profession is surgeon. Uh, he's a doctor, but he conducts a surgery. So his main profession is that. But after 20 years of working, 25 years of working, that surgeon would obviously at some stage go through the phases of becoming, uh, you know, getting promotion, getting uh, promoted to a consultant. He or she would manage a team, uh, a team of doctors who would be trained. And, you know, he oversees some part of the operation, but he steps into management to look at reporting to look at uh, key statistics in terms of, you know, how the operations are done, what is the success rate, and then looks into understanding what resources, advancements, and, you know, other things which need to be brought into the operation theater so that the hospital still is able to provide cutting edge treatment, which is in times uh, and in, 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 in times keeping with the treatment required for patients as illnesses and other bits, you know, have matured over the years and decades that we see. So, There'll be lots of different types of relationships that will that will be uh, there. One of the key words that you will see when we say advocacy or advocacy in health and social care, there are some relationships which are also formed with people who deal with uh, patients who are vulnerable. They feel disadvantaged and they uh, work with these, uh, you know, this this set of patients which are vulnerable or essentially not able to, you know, 
uh, in make independent decision making and in order for them not to be suppressed or you know pressurized to make decisions there are what our people call advocates that you would generally see which are going to be present within a health and social care setting these are people who have health and social care background but they are specially trained to understand the needs and uh, requirements of individuals who are vulnerable uh, because of having uh, you know physical disadvantages or being having a disability and we will discuss this in a bit more detail so in a key setting the role of the advocate people who safeguard uh, against uh, and ensure that compliances regulation and you know um, uh, what do you call the patient rights are respected would be people who would be termed as advocates within a health and social care setting and they are pe they are people who will speak on behalf of the uh, you know patients that they represent because they have disabilities or they have vulnerabilities which cannot or learning disabilities which essentially cannot be addressed uh, you know while they are having or undergoing a procedure so in this case it could be because of mental health it could be because of disability it could be because of incapacitation uh, because of physical disability or in some cases they, uh, you know they would not be in a position to make an informed choice or a decision and in this case the advocates would be stepping in and they would be offering that advice support to be able to ensure that the best interests of the patients are kept into mind or taken into view when treatments are offered uh, you know to such patients so Working relationships is something that we need to understand. Now, before I get into uh, further detail, let's also relate to the word, which is partnership. Now, here, if I say, uh, you know, what are partnerships? So, in because there are three, uh, you know, bits that we'll be looking at in terms of understanding, you know, um, within this particular learning outcome. So, first part is relationships. And then the second part, which I want to bring across is talking about what are partnerships. Now, when you look at the meaning of the word partnership, the partnership basically talks about or basically literally means if I look at what word comes to my mind is association. Now, there is an association between, I would say, two or more people, or in this case, it can be also and or or organizations. And that would be because there is a consistency of working between these two people or more people or two or more sets of organizations, that is where what we will say that these uh, organizations or people have partnership, uh, you know, or are working in partnership. That means they are providing certain sorts of services to people uh, or patients in partnership because one of them uh, cannot provide the entire set of solutions or support and has to depend on the other to be able to provide this particular solution to the patient or care to the patient. So partnerships in health and social care actually are quite important because they bring two separate organizations uh, together or within the set of organizations, lots of people together with the similar skill set to be able to then provide uh, pooled expertise, I would say, and resources and also uh, you know care to patients and that is generally you know the benefit of uh, why you know uh, organizations actually work you know in partnership now the role of partnership generally tends to be to enhance quality and resources and i would say uh, you know the quality of service provision so for example you would generally see that at any given stage if there are two or more hospitals or for example two or more setups which combine their working uh, you know to provide uh, the, the combination of providing their workings is primarily done to ensure that they are able to cater to wider demand of the individuals in that area now if a hospital uh, specializes in say for example gynecology that means childbirth and things like that or they specialize in uh, you know say for example treatment of ulcers or any sort of tumors now over a point in time if there is a shift in the pattern in which the way diseases are being detected in a particular area the hospital might decide to add another wing expand to add say for example an oncology department or a search uh, you know heart uh, department because there are patients in that area which would require urgent treatment and it won't be possible for them to uh, you know travel distances to reach another hospital so at some stage these long term plans are put into place wherein either there'll be two setups or hospitals in a proximity area which will divide the load work together 
become a trust and they would then be able to take or in, to cater to more inquiries and take on more patients to be able to offer services rather than running independent set of operations when they are in close proximity and when we know that the population or the members of public in that area would require you know these kind of treatments so generally speaking when we talk about partnerships partnerships are a way of two or more organizations essentially obviously people in that uh, coming together to be able to combine their resources also look at pooling their expertise in some cases when i say power sharing it is primarily you know the ability in this case to be able to offer more services to the members of uh, member of uh, you know say for example to uh, public uh, in the HSC sector. So that would be the goal of partnerships when we talk about partnerships uh, and why they are formed and, you know, essentially what could be uh, the benefits of partnerships, specifically when we talk about health and social care setting. Now, the last bit that we want to talk about is TEAMS. Now, TEAM is actually an acronym for TOGETHER. You know, if I don't know how many of you know TOGETHER, uh, if we do more. So when we talk about, you know, the, um, uh, uh, you know, team in particular, what we are basically looking at is, um, you know, individuals working together and individuals, when I say working together, they are basically working together, um, you know, in some sort of, uh, you know, uh, let, let's say, in terms of, um, you know, under a particular banner or in some cases, you know, um, essentially working together primarily uh, under common objectives. And these will essentially be looking into, uh, you know, um, com people coming together with a certain um, um, type of skill set. And this certain type of skill set will basically mean that, you know, individuals coming together will be able to pool their expertise resources and, you know, um, uh, and then offer broader services. So together, everyone achieves more. So this would be in, uh, you know, in a way, the full form of teamwork. Now, when we talk about teamwork in, you know, say, uh, let's say, or teams essentially, and the meaning of teamwork, uh, you know, in general, we would basically say, the meaning of teamwork is it's a process through which people are going to work collaboratively, collaboratively to accomplish, you know, bigger tasks or bigger goals. So here the objective is if one person cannot complete a particular task, uh, you know, or a big task, it, requ it will require that person to, you know, take a couple of hours or a couple of days to be able to complete a task. Then in those cases, what will happen is managers would put together a team, which is people with similar skill set they will be put together onto a task which will be requiring more than one person's contribution to be able to achieve it or complete it on that day in a week in a month depending on what the task is so here the the teamwork is essential or the team is formed if i say team is essentially formed uh, you know which is uh, to achieve a larger or bigger goal and the process of forming a team is essentially but is nothing but teamwork. So the process of working collaboratively, collaboratively within a group, uh, you know, as a number of people will come together to achieve a larger goal will essentially be what is called, you know, teamwork. Now, there are lots of teamwork uh, or team building models, uh, you know, which have come up over the years. There are a couple of them that you need to know. There is something called Tuckman's team building model. There is further research which was done by Dr. Belbin and Dr. Meredith Belbin essentially, you know, um, uh, elaborate his work actually elaborates. So if I say this is a team building model, Dr. Belbin's work essentially elaborated on team roles. So he came about with nine type of roles under three categories, which essentially when you try and when managers try and put a team together to be able to accomplish a larger goal, they get 
people from different departments, different places, different skill sets, different experience together. And when the team comes together or these side people come together to form a team, there are specific roles which each of them gets aligned or, you know, uh, given within the team to perform. And these specific roles, which were categorized in three different types by Dr. Belbin, you know, is the work that he's done. And now that has been widely accepted within organizations that if I come with a certain background, I have certain skill experience, I might not be wanting to do a particular type of work in a team. Because if I have 25 years of experience and I know how things are done, I might not be willing to take up an initial or an entry level job because that would be my that would be maybe not a good use of my skill set. So when we look at identifying types of roles which are given to people within a team when it is formed, that comes across from Dr. Belbin's model um, uh, of team, uh, you know, team roles. So his model of team roles. And when we talk about team building, there are lots of different models apart from Tuckman's, Dr. Bruce Tuckman's, you know, model of uh, team building. But these are models that you need to be aware of that when teams are put together, when groups of people are put together into a close working uh, group, uh, in order to accomplish a larger goal, they will be using the process of what is called teamwork or team building. And team building would involve looking at, you know, certain models through which they can be put together or brought together by looking at their skill set, their, uh, their experience, their academic background, and, you know, obviously their contributions that they will be able to make when they work uh, together to accomplish or work towards achieving that larger goal. Now, <clears throat> With these three terms in mind, let's get into some of the assessment criteria that we have, uh, you know, in this particular unit. So any questions on this so far? Any questions, anybody? Okay, so we are clear about the term, what is relationship? We are clear about the term, what is partnership? We are clear about the term, what is team and what is teamwork? And essentially what we are going to do is relate these terms to the discussion that we are going to do with regards to some of the assessment criteria. Now, the first assessment criteria that we have is it talks about different working relationships in health and social care setting. Now, as I discussed and I put a bit of a, uh, you know, example when we talk about a hospital and if you think of what kind of working relationships or what kind of relationships or what kind of teams essentially would be working together in the hospital to deliver services to the patient, this is what you will probably look at when it comes to your mind. So when we look at working relationships, which are formed, they are formed, uh, you know, primarily for the reason of ensuring that there is dependency and then the care, which is being put together as a plan can be delivered to the patient, keeping in mind their needs and their requirements. Now, the, when we look at working in relation, working closer, working and working with, uh, you know, working within relationships within the setting, there are certain rules that we have to follow. And this, these rules that people follow when they come together to work in a group and have a dependency on each other, they need to ensure that they are following the six C's of care. That means the duty of care tends to be revolving around the six C's, which really need to be focused on ensuring that they are compassionate. They are, uh, you know, communicating. Uh, they have, uh, you know, the basic fundamentals of understanding how do we put, uh, you know, the uh, patient's requirement first. So when we talk about these six C's of care, we are talking about that they are the duty. They are bound by the duty of care. They have compassion that they can show towards patient in terms of understanding their needs and requirements. They have the courage to be able to make the right decisions or essentially inform their superiors when they are looking and making the right decisions or if there are things which are not going wrong, they have the courage to speak up. They are able to communicate clearly and effectively. They have commitment towards their work and obviously they have competence because of their academic background and the experience they've gained over the years. Now, when these relationships are formed, they can be formed between, uh, between the nurse or the healthcare worker and their family or the individual. They can be formed with the colleagues. They can be also relationships which are formed in terms of working relationship between nurses, between GPs, doctors, psychologists, advocates, you know, occupational therapists, things, people that you can think of that work within a hospital and you can widen your, uh, you know, uh, understanding by looking at, you know, if the patient has undergone surgery and after the surgery, the patient is doing patient recovery, 
And in the recovery, the patient requires physiotherapy sessions. Then at some stage, you are in the journal ward. You would be daily going to the physiotherapist. Uh, uh, and the nurses or the healthcare workers who are involved would be basically looking at ensuring that your ther therapy and the sessions which are scheduled are going as planned and it is helping you recover or get back onto your feet. So in this case, there would be a close working relationship between the nurse uh, and in the journal ward, the healthcare professionals in the journal ward, patient uh, workers who basically transfer the patient on the bed or the, say, for example, the stretcher or in this case, a wheelchair to the physiotherapy department in the hospital. The occupational physiotherapist who is a qualified person would then be looking at doing some of these sessions. Uh, there could be a psychiatrist which would could be involved and this would be for motivation, understanding the patient, you know, uh, maybe in some cases also looking at the perspective of how the patient feels after undergoing, you know, physiotherapy sessions. Are, is it too taxing? Is it too stressful? Is it helping in terms of recovery? And all this would be done with a close set of people which will be working uh, as a team to help the patient recover, to help the patient essentially, you know, uh, get pet, get better and obviously get back on their feet. So if you think of some of these relationships and explain in two or three or four bullet points, they would be looking at, uh, you know, completing this particular task because it talks about describe. So what we need to uh, understand is what kind of relationships can be formed. So we are looking at relationships between the healthcare professional, the nurse, or maybe the healthcare professional and the patient and the family of the patient you're looking at relationships with your colleagues. You could also be talking about relationships that you have typically, you know, between as working professionals, between nurses and doctors, between healthcare professionals, and, you know, essentially say um, people who work within the hospital or the setup, and they could be care staff, they could be supervisors, they could be employees, and they could be professionals. So generally, if we look at care staff, uh, there could be a care relationship between the care staff, which is the staff which is dealing with the patient on a daily basis, and some of the managers or supervisors who basically look after reporting and look after the upkeep of the general ward, say, for example. And in this case, there could be a, a superior subordinate relationship. When we talk about co-workers, you could have relationships that I'm working as a nurse and you're working as a nurse or I'm working as a healthcare professional and so you are. So in this case, the working relationship would be of the similar type that means we play a similar role i might be responsible for a few patients you might be responsible for another set of patients and in this case the relationship that we have in terms of uh you know meeting uh, each other or when we meet in say for example during break or during lunch time or during the start of our shifts we would probably get the similar set of briefings which are primarily required to do our job or deliver the work which has been re required to be done on a daily basis so this would basically be the uh, idea of understanding how working relationships are typically, uh, you know, developed and how they are formed when we talk about, uh, you know, a, a set, uh, say, for example, care setting. So if you're working within an organization, you could have an employee, uh, you know, relationship. That means you and somebody else in the same department, you could have an employee in a customer relationship. You could have an employee and a manager relationship. That means my with my manager, you could have a, a professional relationship with your co-workers. And that would all be the remit of this particular, uh, you know, task. <clears throat> so here, what we are looking at is we are looking at professional relationships and they are not to be confused with personal relationships. I'm a, I'm a, I say, for example, I'm a trained doctor, but my wife is also a doctor and we work in the same place, we have a personal relationship because we are married or, you know, you you, you are related to each other. But at, at the place of work, we are focused on, in this particular task, a working relationship. Now, she might work in a different department. I might work in a different department, but we might work with each other from time to time because if I am a heart surgeon and she's a gynae, and obviously, you know, if you are working with a patient which requires both these services and you know, in this case, two of us come together and offer that service with the team, then obviously that will become a professional relationship. So here the task focuses on we needing to talk about relationships with individuals that you support, that you support their family relationships that you have on in terms of working with your colleagues at the place of work, relationship that you could have with outside agencies. You know, sometimes when you look at working with agencies, um, uh, say, for example, you are a social care worker 
and you are uh, you know working with an external agency and that external agency would put you onto a rota system or you know ask you to go and meet or you know provide services to a number of professionals but you work there you also work with the national health service so in this case you are working with an external uh, you know agency which is providing job related uh, shifts or requirements to you and in those cases you would have a pro professional working relationship with that agency you might be on their payroll you might be looking at uh, you know doing some additional work as locum but this is where your relationship essentially would be classified as a professional working relationship with your uh, you know, with, with an agency which could be an outsider or which could be an outside company which is providing services to the place of work wherein you are essentially delivering care. Now, a simple example that I would also put there would be like if you work in the hospital and you work within the, say, for example, a particular, you work within a particular, uh, you know, um, let's say department. Now, if you are working and working within the general ward when people get discharged from ICU and if they have requirement of oxygen, for example, you work with the anesthetist, anesthetist you work with the nurse who basically looks after, uh, you know, providing customers with ox oxygen related equipment, then you also would be aware that there's an external supplier which provides oxygen or oxygen related equipment to the hospital. If you are in the administration, you might be dealing with that external agency to replenish stock, to look at, uh, you know, getting the equipment repaired or replaced as and when required. And in those cases, you are dependent on a specialist external agency who would be medically qualified to be able to provide these services. And that, because you're working with that agency as a retained agency or as an agency which provides these services throughout the year in terms of our annual maintenance contract, or essentially as and when the repair or you know update services are required and you deal with them uh, constantly, that is where your working relationship would be established with the external agency. Now, any questions on this uh, uh, first criteria that we have discussed? Okay, let's move on to the second one. Now, second criteria talks about explaining the role of advocate. Now, if you recall, when I spoke about advocates, what we mean by advocates are people who essentially support patients who are vulnerable, who are feeling disadvantaged, or in some cases, they have physical oblique learning disabilities, and they need some, or it could be older people as well, and they could be people with, say, mental health problems and things like that. And they would essentially be looking at supporting and providing safeguards to people by speaking to them and then ensuring they understand their requirements and then allowing the care workers and the uh, care plan to be put together, which does not do or provide uh, care, which is against their needs and wishes, uh, takes into account their dignity, their individuality, and then provides them sufficient information uh, to be able to make informed decisions. So the main aim of people who work within this particular role, uh, when we talk about advocates or advocacy, is to listen to the views of the patient, to raise concerns of the patient with relevant staff, to help them explore options by giving them information that they need. And this information then allows them to make decisions independently. They are the ones which basically would also look into whether the patient is being pressurized to make a decision or the pressure is, or the patient is essentially making an independent decision by taking into account all the information which is provided. They will also be looking at contacting relevant people and contacting them on behalf of the patient if required to give them uh, you know, the details of the treatment or the, you know, the process that they will, they will go through for the purposes of receiving treatment. And in some cases, you would feel if you do not have enough knowledge, or say, for example, enough experience, then people who work within this field as advocates will also be ex sometimes accompanying the patients in meetings with their consultant, with their doctors, with nurses. And in some cases, you know, they might also be looking at uh, doing things like interpreting services uh, if you are very shy or if you don't speak the language or you do not understand the culture then these people will step in and obviously help uh, in 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 basically you know explaining some of these things either through the route of uh, you know um, 
say for example interpretation or in some cases communication because of certain barriers could be say for example language barrier and their main aim is to primarily safeguard people who have disabilities or can feel vulnerable when they are receiving treatment because they are incapacitated because of their physical or learning disability or mental health care and that is where these people will step in and work with the patient so that they are able to get the right care and uh, you know the right sort of treatment uh, or correct sort of treatment which is required uh, by helping them take that informed decision by providing information. Now, in general, when we look at the role of advocacy or advocates, this is now mandated by law. So when we look at the CARE Act of 2014, here the patient should be able to, uh, you know, take part in a discussion. Uh, and this discussion, if it is related to the treatment, uh, directly related to the treatment that the patient is going to receive, then the patient should also be able to make an independent decision basis the discussion or the information which has been provided. Now, if we feel, and I repeat that bit, is if we if we see that the patient is incapacitated, has some sort of a disability because of their old age, mental health uh, care issues, or it has learning or learning disabilities, and they feel vulnerable, and in those cases, their wishes, their views, feelings, and beliefs have to be considered, and they would be considered by the advocate who is actually supporting the patient in un in undergoing that particular treatment. So in in some cases you would generally see that local authorities when we talk about you know councils in the uk local authorities essentially or councils in the uk would basically put uh, in uh, you know people and put them into um, in say for example would allocate people who can become advocates and help the patient receive information undergo that treatment by appointing advocates because they feel that the people uh, or in this case some of the patients have dis disabilities or you know vulnerabilities then in those cases the advocate would listen to their views get their concerns to the table and obviously provide them rights and correct information to be able to you know help them make the decision and the local authority in this case would be happy to support you know, that particular patient uh, with an appropriate person or an advocate who would be able to represent them. And generally in those cases, sometimes people tend to appoint, uh, you know, people as advocates, which are uh, maybe a near dear one or a family member or a very close friend who is going to be able to support them uh, in, in terms of their requirements when they undergo this particular treatment. Now, there are various checks which are done. Uh, uh, a data, uh, you know, a CRB check is done, a criminal record check is done to ensure that the person being recruited uh, or, you know, being asked to advocate or, you know, step in to do the uh, pr process of, uh, you know, providing advocacy to the patient is, uh, you know, not on any sort of a, a register which basically conforms to that the person has been, uh, you know, convicted in the past or has abused the system in the past. So they, they, there is a proper check which is done. And in this case, professional carers which are appointed to this particular role sometimes tend to be paid by the local authority or the council. And in this case, their work is predominantly done on a charitable basis or in some cases, you know, paid for from the local authority. And they would then be looking at providing unconditional support and representing the needs and requirements of the patient who are vulnerable or having disabilities uh, in, in some cases because of old age or learning disabilities or, you know, have mental health problems. So is that bit clear? What is the role of the advocate and how they would help in assessing the individuals, uh, you know, uh, who require, uh, you know, uh, say, for example, uh, support uh, because of the vulnerabilities or disabilities that they have and they are not able to you know, able to make the decisions themselves. And that would be something that you generally see would be people uh, have, or they will be trained staff or people available within a hospital, within a setup, and they would be the ones which will be taking up this particular role. Now, the next bit that we talk about uh, in the next assessment criteria is explaining why it is important to work in partnership with others. Now, here the benefits of partnerships have to be talked about. So, you know, it is sometimes quite evident and clear that what are the benefits of 
uh, or you know what are the positive outcomes of working uh, individuals working in partnership and it's not very difficult to uh, you know emphasize them is that when you look at people working in partnerships they are able to obviously look at increasing their knowledge they are able to share their skills uh, they are able to put into practice some of the uh, you know skills and experience that they've gained over the years to accomplish or help the organization accomplish a larger goal now sometimes when we look at jobs which are assigned or our responsibilities on a day to day basis that we are expected to deliver within uh, the hospital for example as a healthcare professional could be quite uh, you know quite a task and in those cases those will need to be broken down into smaller tasks and then assigned to a group of individuals who will be working together in a team or as as uh, very working close, closely together in a team to be able to deliver them and deliver them to the right standard and uh, uh, you know i would say right to the correct quality standards which are required as per the cqc now this is required because it is important for individuals essentially to ensure that when we look at partnership partnership is a case wherein people will come together and they will deal with a set of problems or several elements of a problem and they would then be looking at coming together to be able to provide a reasonable solution which will work with the patient and uh, you know support the care plan or the care planning uh, say for example the services that are being given to the patient and would support them in terms of delivery of that care plan to the uh, patient now partnership also makes it easier as we talked about collaboratively collaboratively which is the word we used is because when people work together they are able to accomplish larger goals and in this case when you look at nurses when you look at healthcare professionals as they work together they are able to you know have the patient discharged off from a general ward or you know move the patient from an icu to a general ward uh, because they are looking and working to ensure all vital stats all recovery part of uh, you know signs which are required to be observed are being done and proper treatment care nutrition is being provided which allows the patients uh, you know to recover quickly or allows them to have a speedy recovery now partnerships are based on the fact that they would empower people to be able to make decisions when they work together in teams so when we look at partnership and we look at the concept of power sharing what we mean by that when i use the word in the earlier slide power sharing is that it is the effective and delegative decision making so decision making is delegated to all levels of uh, you know when people are working together in teams they know when to make the decision they don't need to go across uh, to their supervisor or their manager they are competent enough to be able to make in, uh, you know decisions and those decisions are made keeping in mind treatment tests support packages which are provided or you know the services which are being provided to the patient uh, you know and 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 the whole goal of that being to help the patient recover uh, you know as quickly as possible or uh, you know and allowing them the freedom to be able to recover and meeting and providing for the needs of the patient as and when required to be able to help them recover uh, in that recovery plan so when we talk about partnerships we are looking at partnerships essentially uh, being uh, a very important cornerstone within health and social care sector because no care or uh, you know the full care i say for example if you have a care plan somebody has undergone let's take an example if a patient has undergone surgery now if the patient is to recover from that surgery there are lots of different types of people which will be working with the patient to you know help him or her recover from that surgery there would be patients who are there would be people who are essentially nurses healthcare workers healthcare assistants doctors consultants who would be playing their role in uh, the recovery there will be people who would be uh, you know like clinical nurses which look into medication and you know administration uh, of administering that medicine to the patient at regular intervals there will be nutritionist which will be involved which will be ensuring that a balanced diet is provided to the patient for the duration uh, after the operation which the patient is looking at recovery now they will all be reading from the same songbook the or the hymn book as we call it because there is a clear plan which is made and that clear plan would have different set of people working together to be able to deliver that care plan or that care as per the planning which has been done 
for the patient to help recover. And in those cases, you would generally see that people will be working very closely together in partnership to deliver this particular care, uh, you know, deliver care as per the care plan, which has been put forward even before the patient went and had the surgery. So if you have, imagine if you have nurses or healthcare professionals or people who have not worked together, they do not understand what I'm doing or what the, you are doing or what you're supposed to do. Then in this case, imagine the chaos which will be there wherein they will be looking at maybe doing tasks repetitively. There would be tasks which are which could be done haphazardly and not in a particular order. It might create, uh, you know, uh, problems for the patient because the patient would, uh, you know, not understand or feel how the treatment is being given and feel that, you know, the treatment is out of place in terms of how it needs to be administered. For example, if I look at, if you've undergone surgery and there are some dressing of, uh, you know, uh, wounds or other things which have to be done. Now, if you have the nurse coming in and giving you medication first, you being fed first and at a later stage, your wound is being dressed and somebody is coming in to take change your dressings, you would feel that, you know, this might not be the correct uh, aspect because or the correct approach in which this has to be done. So if I look at a care plan, it would mean maybe first thing in the morning, once you've woken up, your wounds and dressings would be checked. They would be changed. Your linen and other bits would need to be changed. After that, you would probably get, uh, you know, some tea, coffee, or, you know, some light refreshments. Uh, you do a bit of, uh, you know, freshening up, your bed linen, other things change. You get medication, you get the breakfast. After that, you would again be checked for vital signs and, you know, some equipment and other bits would be put on, which will allow the your vital stats to be monitored, you know, from outside the ward or, uh, you know, from a central station within the hospital. Now, there will be regular visits by the consultant, by the doctors, by the nurses. And if you need anything in between, you would have the uh, option to, you know, press a buzzer or maybe uh, speak to a healthcare assistant or a worker who's basically doing the rounds uh, or is, is you know, on a shift maintaining, uh, you know, that contact with you uh, while you are there in the ward. Now, imagine if this is to happen the other way around. First thing in the morning, you have your breakfast, then your wound dressing is done after that, then your bed linen happens in the evening. You'd feel that this is not working in, uh, you know, any sort of coordination or it's not going as per what probably should happen when a uh, when when the uh, you know care is being delivered as per a plan so here if pe uh, nurses doctors healthcare assistant consultants you know uh, people in the ward work together then they are able to execute some of these tasks and communicate to each other and then do them in a uh, chronological order or a fashion which would be right for the patient right for the patient care and also ensure that it is done systematically not just for one patient but for all the other patients in the ward so typically you would see normally a doctor comes into and does a ward round maybe around 12 to 1 or you know 8 to 9 in the mornings because people need to be seen before their change of medication has to happen or other things overnight they've stayed in the in the in the hospital or in the ward and in this case, it requires closer working between a set of team, uh, between these set of people, which I term call as team, nurse, healthcare professional, doctor, clinical nurse, and, uh, you know, the doctor which has been there on the shift overnight before the, he or she hands over to a consultant who would do the round in the morning and, you know, update on the progress. And these kind of things, or junior doctors, for example, which will be looking into it, and then a consultant will come in and do the round and then speak to the patient, see how the treatment is coming along. Uh, is the patient recovery happening? Uh, are the patient showing vital signs of recovery? Uh, and they would then be progressed in a way wherein it shows that uh, this particular, when I say these set of people, doctors, junior doctors, nurses, doc, uh, consultants, uh, healthcare professionals are working together as a team in partnership on a daily basis to be able to deliver care to the uh, patient. So is this bit clear? And what I've done is I've explained this using one or two examples on the slide so that you have a good understanding in terms of why partnerships are important and what are the benefits of partnership when we talk in general, the uh, you know health and social care setting. Any questions on this so far? Right, 
that brings us to the next criteria, which is uh, which is talking about the role of teams in providing coordinated approach to service delivery. Now, here, as I mentioned to you earlier, when I talk about uh, teams, we talk about uh, you know multidisciplinary teams in the context of you know health and social care. So, when I talk about multidisciplinary teams, you know, in in terms of uh, health and social care context, so first is team. We look at a number of people being put together in a group and they would work together as, as a group to be able to deliver certain objectives. Now, when we talk about uh, teams in general, we use the term MDT, multidisciplinary teams. And this is nothing but combining or involving several uh, people from different backgrounds, academic experience, professional backgrounds, who are going to come together to be able to solve a particular problem or who are going to be brought together to basically work together uh, brought together from different places or departments or because of their areas of specialization, but they'll be brought together to help accomplish a particular problem or help solve a particular problem or accomplish a goal. And when we talk about, you know, multidisciplinary teams in, in the context of, uh, you know, health and social care, what we mean by that in particular is that they are going to be people which are going to come together from different, with different background experiences, specialities, and a skill set and they'll be coming together to organize and coordinate the delivery of uh, integrated care services which are going to be meeting the needs of the individual and in some cases if the individuals require complex care so when we talk about uh, you know uh, in general say for example multidisciplinary teams we would refer to people which work within these teams and they could be gps social workers nurses healthcare professionals practitioners and in general, and they would be working together to make decisions regarding the treatment of individual patients and different types of service users. And they would be working together within both health and social care settings. So when we in general talk about this particular approach, this approach is important because it helps in providing or creating options for treatment of patients uh, in a particular health and social care setting. And what we would generally see is that these teams which are formed would be looking at, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say providing a, a, a lot of different varied services depending on their skill set and requirement in terms of the plan, uh, service plan or, you know, the care plan for the patients, but they will be providing them as a, as a coordinated unit. And that is where you would look at multidisciplinary teams. Now, in order to explain this in more in the context of, you know, health and social care, what I would do is basically play this video, which is from Sky, which is the Social Care Institute of, uh, you know, Excellence. And that is where you generally see how, uh, you know, when we talk about teams and in particular MDTs, which are prevalent in health and social care, would be relevant and useful for the purposes of uh, providing treatment to patients. So let me switch you over to this particular video, which I want you to see. And this is on the Sky website. So I'm gonna play this video from there. And let's listen into this video. Health professionals working together. The MDT begins to deliver person centered and coordinated care and support with the person with acute needs. It could include a doctor, a social worker, a physiotherapist, and or staff in local authority, housing, and voluntary organisations. These professionals can work together to deliver person centered and coordinated care and support with the person with care needs. Holistic and integrated, or to put it another way, seeing the big picture and working together for the benefit of the service user or person with care and support needs. Like anyone, they have complex lives, needs and situations. They may have many interventions in addition to having some great personal strengths. An effective MDT can bring professional and non-organizational specialisms and use the best of the knowledge and skills on hand to deliver great outcomes. Who are MDTs and that? The simple answer is anyone who can benefit from comprehensive, continuous, and seamless care. 
This includes adults, children, people with mental health problems, and older people. While suitable for people with single conditions, evidence indicates that integrated care is especially effective for people with complex needs. Improved outcomes include treatment planning, patient experience, and continuity of care. Building a successful MDT. The MDT needs to embrace some important factors to succeed in delivering good outcomes. These may include shared vision, informal opportunity to chat, trusting relationships, good professional development, and dedicated case managers. Person-centered, collaborative, and integrated. A multidisciplinary team working together can deliver excellent results for a wide range of people with diverse needs and desired outcomes. Comprehensive, continuous, and seamless care can be the result. So as you can see here, what we are basically seeing is that when we talk about MDTs, they are, you know, important because when integrated care has to be provided uh, to patients which have complex needs in terms of treatment plans, and they could be when people are undergoing surgery, recovering from surgery, cancer treatments, for example, or long-term conditions that require, uh, you know, sustained planning in terms of providing care. And this would involve, you know, people which will need to come together from family, from their friends, from the community, uh, from the healthcare staff, from, you know, various different sets of people which will work with the patients to be able to deliver these services or basically the uh, complex plan which is required in terms of care. And that is where we use the word integrated plan. Now, when we talk about role of teams, it is quite clear when we talk about multidisciplinary teams and how people, they have to come together to be able to provide this care plan uh, to patients. Now, because it talks about evaluation in this particular task, we need to be able to look at a specific example. And what I've done here is I've looked at a particular case study of multidisciplinary team, MDT, which is going to come together to be able to deliver uh, this complex care plan uh, you know, to uh, an individual. So this case study is basically, you know, from the Sky website uh, from which we watch the video. And I put the role, uh, the link to the case study here. And what I would suggest is that you need to look at, there are a couple of other case studies, but this is one case study that I would suggest that you would need to go through in order to understand how uh, teams, uh, what is the role of teams in providing this coordinated approach uh, specifically for patients which require, uh, you know, uh, care planning. And that is because of the fact that they have, uh, you know, severe conditions or conditions which basically uh, require treatment to be delivered over a period of time. And the case study would nicely help you to understand how uh, things are put into place as an integrated plan. What are the teams of people which are involved in delivering this? And, you know, how the patient benefits from receiving this integrated uh, care plan, which is delivered over a point in time and helps the patient recover. So there are some bits which have been obviously covered and I've gleaned them from the website. And, you know, this is where the case study uh, needs to be looked at. And the case study basically talks about, uh, you know, a hospital and a foundation trust, which is the Berkshire Health NHS Foundation Trust, which basically looks at delivering uh, you know, mental health uh, works very closely with the mental health trust and provides services to patients which are uh, challenged because of, uh, you know, their mental health uh, disabilities. And in order to put a plan together, they have looked at the MDT uh, concept and approach, which is the multidisciplinary teams. And this is wherein the uh, basic, uh, you know, Bracknell Forest team, which is another community center delivering services, the National Health Foundation Trust, NHS, and the hospital have come together to provide this particular, uh, you know, mental health care services to a set of patients in that area. And that allows them to access facilities, you know, uh, to be able to reach across to healthcare workers uh, uh, using community hub, using zoning, and this overall has led to the improvement of how services are delivered to patients having mental health, uh, mental health related, uh, you know, deficiencies in that area. And that shows the working of, uh, you know, coordination that shows the working of teams 
coordinated effort uh, using MDTs to be able to deliver these services to patients in that uh, particular uh, you know area. Now, the last assessment criteria in this particular learning outcome talks about you know analysis of how team leadership can address challenges. Now, this is a particular uh, task in which we need to discuss what are the benefits of leadership which uh, uh, you know uh, are required or people in leadership positions are required to show certain characteristics or trait which will help overcome some of the challenges which uh, you know people face when they are working together as a team within a particular health and social care setup. Now here we look at a, a couple of things that when we talk about leadership, so for example, when we talk about leadership in health and social care, when we when we look at uh, this in particular, there are certain types of skills that we will need to uh, see that people need to have, uh, you know, within this sector. And those leadership skills are, uh, you know, going to be important because people will be able to develop those skills over a point in time because of their experience, their academic background, their consistent delivery of services that they've done over the, over the years within a particular setup. And because of their uh, ability to be able to reach goals and achieve the milestones which are set by management, this would allow them to move into what is called a leadership position. Now, in general, when we talk about leadership, we talk about people who are able to, you know, uh, get others behind their objectives. That means that they have a very good way of how people can essentially look at, uh, you know, um, get uh, them to buy the buy into their vision, look into the long term uh, goals or the objectives of the organization, and uh, in this case, the health and social care setup, or maybe a care home hospital, and then they are able to move them towards uh, by uh, you know asking them to take up roles and then completing or achieve, you know helping and supporting them to complete those uh, roles and responsibilities in order to effectively deliver services to patients. Say for example, in this case, hospital. Now. Most leaders would be looking at coming up with a long-term leadership plan. That means they will have a short-term plan and they have a long-term plan. The long-term plan was essentially be related to the fact that they would be looking into resources. They would be looking into uh, capabilities which the staff need to have, training and development needs. They'll be looking into understanding what kind of uh, facilities or infrastructure which the hospital or the, in this case the setup needs to augment or have and they would then put this particular you know uh, uh, let's put this way they will put these resources into place whether it's staff manpower training and development financial administrative resources they would be putting them into place so that this delivery of services to patients can be done effectively now when we talk about leadership nhs has a long term leadership plan and that is called the nhs ltp plan and this slide that you see here is nothing but the snapshot of the nhs long term uh, plan which has been put in place by the management at nhs to ensure that uh, you know there is integration and innovation being brought into the organization and the national health service wherein people would essentially work together to provide improved health and social care services to all patients which are uh, in need of receiving that. And this particular leadership plan prioritizes the interests of wider systems which are required to be put into place that will aid in delivery of this plan and the health and social care services to patients. That means things like implementation of technology. So for example, if a patient record system or a patient information system is, uh, if you look at the NHS in the early 2000s, the NHS invested a billion pounds in creating a centralized IT system. Now this centralized IT system means every patient in the UK has an NHS number and that number helps us identify your records within the NHS anywhere in the UK. So whether you go to a GP surgery, a hospital, any, any department or any other setup which is related to uh, you know, providing you services, <clears throat> this NHS number would be able to relate and pick out your records or pull out your records on us from the central database. Now, this was put into place by the 
core management in the NHS and they took a decision to spend this money. And obviously this system is upgraded, updated and maintained, uh, you know, over the years to ensure that it still meets the requirements of practitioners within uh, the health and social care or within the National Health Service so that, you know, services can be effectively delivered. Now, before this, all the information was held in paper-based records. So I had a patient information record, you had an operation an x-ray or something like that which had been uh, given out as treatment to you or medication they were all available as uh, you know manual records but with the digitization and uh, use of technology the leadership resolved to uh, this you know basically looked at resolving this is because going forward the needs and the patients have become uh, are becoming complex the records uh, were uh, you know is not something which was manageable so over a point in time, this system was put into place and this system has now become the fundamental, you know, back, uh, let's say the core of how information about patients is stored, retrieved and archived and used within any sort of requirements in the National Health Service. Now, this is an example of how leadership looks at addressing challenges, which is challenges of paperwork and records and maintaining records, upkeeping records, retrieving records, which was solved uh, by making uh, a decision which allowed the implementation of IT systems into the National Health Service. And this implementation of the IT system in the National Health Service then led to, uh, you know, records being um, uh, stored in terms of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way where they were stored, uh, you know, structuredly, they were uh, you know, they are, they, they are basically being, uh, in, let's say this, or the advantages are that it makes it easy for use, for retrieval, and for reference when it is required to provide, you know, treatment to uh, patients. Now, when we look at some of the other aspects of what are the other challenges which uh, are faced within this sector when people are working, and how do leaders look at you know, overcoming these challenges is that they look at putting teams together. And when we look at, uh, you know, leadership putting teams together, they are looking at putting teams together primarily to ensure that larger object objectives or tasks which cannot be accomplished by one person uh, then are assigned to team and tasks which are done repetitively are assigned to a team or a department. And they then do those tasks uh, effectively ensuring quality standards and, you know, care standards do not slip. Now, when we talk about, um, you know, essentially uh, the role of leadership and how they they look at overcoming these challenges, what we mean by that is that leadership is focused on ensuring that the organization, which is in this case the National Health Service, is geared and ready to meet the challenges which could come because of uh, you know, various, uh, you know, developments which happen in the sector. So when we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, just as an example, we saw, a lot, uh, you, we saw, you know, the National Health Service showing leadership in terms of making bold decisions or people within leadership positions within the National Health Service and the Department of Health taking bold decisions uh, to bring this pandemic under control in the UK. And globally also, you see that uh, being done by the World Health Organization. We look at different departments within different countries working together uh, to bring this under, uh, you know, bring this pandemic under control. Now, what they did, if you look at the NHS, there was a core team which was formed uh, at the at the prime minister's level, the cabinet level, and that involved, you know, say, for example, the appointment of a vaccination minister. So under Matt Algate, which was then the health secretary uh, in the UK, you have Nadeem Zahavi, which was the vaccinations minister. So when vaccinations became available, uh, the government created a leadership team under Nadeem Zahavi as a minister who led the vaccination drive uh, throughout the country. And the idea was to ensure that everyone gets the dose uh, of the vaccine, starting with a declining you know, age scale from you know, any, anybody over the age of 75, anybody over the age of 65, and then 55, 40, 35, everybody. And then you know, this was essentially done. Now, there were lots of different types of people which were involved in primarily you know, delivering this particular uh, vaccination. And UK was one of the top three countries which basically you know, successfully, uh, you know, uh, delivered the vaccination 
drive and covered, you know, 80, 85 percent of the population within a span of, you know, six to eight months. Amongst other countries, there were UAE, there was Saudi Arabia, you had US, wherein, you know, the vaccination drive, uh, you know, lacked then what uh, in terms of UK and the UK, uh, you know, uh, uh, health Department of Health did. And they took the first steps to ensure that, you know, uh, we need to get these vaccines in, even if lots of countries were debating that, you know, they are not tested and, you know, they are not fully tested and we should not rush to vaccinate all the population. But the team leadership team at the government level took that decision. And that is an example of at a macro level, how leadership works within, uh, you know, the health and social care sector. So that would then be drilled down into coordinating teams, contingency teams, ancillary teams and support services and administration, which made the whole vaccination program successful. So the core team was maybe formed at the Department of Health, the Ministry of Health, essentially in the UK, with Nadeem Zahavi being appointed as the minister. Then there were hospitals, trusts, pharmacies, schools, you know, lots of different types of places which were take, uh, taken up and then made in, or converted into vaccination centers. There were lots of different types of regional teams which were formed, which then led this particular drive of vaccination. And that's how you generally get to see how leadership looks at you know, delivering solutions when it comes to, uh, you know, problems which are faced at the, uh, you know, at the national level, at the, say, for example, at a local level or the local authority level. And there were involvements from all uh, facets of different types of teams uh, to be able to deliver this and make this particular vaccination drive, you know, successful. And in general, if I put it this way, that when we talk about the role of leader, so in this case, the Prime Minister at that point in time, Boris Johnson, led that particular thing from the start. So things like lockdowns or if there were measures which had to be put into place to, you know, avoid the spread of virus, the government took those steps. Then we talk about, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, role modeling, there were role models which were created, uh, you know, within the NHS which basically, uh, you know, say, for example, certain ethnic groups did not want to have vaccination. So role models were sought into and, you know, uh, you know, campaigns were rolled out by Public Health uh, England, PHE, to ensure that, uh, to educate people to say vaccination is safe and effective and everybody should get vaccinated. Knowledge about issues were, you know, published, risk assessment was done, and then obviously, you know, training, shadowing, and of making sure that people were divided into teams to be able to deliver and get this job done was essentially done. And that is where you would see how leadership comes in and, you know, looks after and, you know, uh, looks after mitigating the risks and, you know, uh, meeting the challenges which are required to accomplish, uh, you know, the goal, which is to bring the pandemic under control. Because if you see every country, every economy, probably more or less, you know, went into recession. Uh, they were, uh, we have dealt with the pandemic for over two years in most economies and most countries. And this was something which, you know, uh, was a resolute uh, decision taken by the prime minister and his team to ensure that, you know, we come out of it and, you know, we come out of the pandemic and we, we are able to, uh, you know, have as less as loss of life possible uh, uh, due to, you know, the COVID-19 uh, virus. So this is maybe an example, you know, probably at a very high level, but essentially what you generally see that when we talk about leadership, uh, you know, in health and social care, there are lots and lots of case studies which are available. Uh, and I would say that, you know, at some stage, you could probably look at, um, you know, putting an example specifically related to, uh, you know, reading a particular article, which talks about how leaders in the National Health Service come together and then look at solving some of the health-related problems uh, with, the, with an article in particular, which I have provided on Moodle. And that is going to be useful as an additional read, um, which I'm going to show you now. And this one would help shed more light on the role of leadership uh, and their role that they play in overcoming challenges within uh, when people are working in la you know on big projects and in large teams within the national health service so if you look at reading some of the summary of this particular article which is pages 2 to 5 i think you would probably get a very good idea in terms of 
how leadership looks at solving challenges which are faced by uh, teams when they are working to deliver or accomplish a particular objective which has been set. Uh, and in this case, I've given an example of the COVID-19 pandemic and the vaccination drive, which the uh, you know government led from the start to vaccinate as much of the population as possible in the shortest possible time to save as many lives as possible uh in in you know when while the while when we were trying to bring this pandemic under control right so with this we come to the end of discussion of today's learning outcome i hope you have understood and uh, you know uh, this link of the report is what i put here uh, for you to be able to go in and read additionally if you have to and then this copy of the presentation would also be available along with the handout on moodle just after the session so any questions on our discussion so far? Any questions at this stage? Right. So if there are no more questions, then we will be meeting up tomorrow with regards to discussing learning outcome five, uh, which is going to be dwelling into the principles of care planning. So until then, thank you so much for joining and I will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.